Welcome, everyone, to uh, the Ash Center for, innovation, uh, for Democratic Governance and Innovation. This is actually the first event of the semester in our democracy series. Um, this year, uh, as you may know, and if not, we'll be bombarding you with emails to let you know, we have a special focus on challenges to democracy in the United States. And it's an appropriate theme because this is the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's address at Gettysburg. And that address ends famously at the end when Lincoln says uh, that uh, we shall, that these honored dead shall not have died in vain, um, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. And so over the course of the next two years, we will explore whether or not American democracy is in another such crisis, not a civil war, uh, not as such, not a hot civil war, but uh, one in which there's a lot of acrimony. Anyway, uh, but another, uh, uh, but nevertheless, American democracy faces a large number of other grave challenges. Among these are themes which we will be exploring, immigration and population changes, the possibility that our presidency has become too powerful and too large, the theme of the imperial presidency, the opportunities and, and challenges that digital technology raises for democratic governance, and the absence of popular and social movements and how they might be revitalized. Those are just a few of the themes that we'll be exploring over the next couple of years in exploring challenges, but probably more importantly, potential solutions to those challenges of uh, US democracy. The first theme that we will be exploring over the course of several events, of which this is one, is the theme of inequality and American democracy. Um, and uh, just to briefly, not really to introduce the theme, because I think probably everybody in this audience has thought quite a bit about the challenges that inequality raises to American democracy. But I just want to uh, present a couple of um, thoughts, of quotations for you to reflect upon um, and to reflect on whether or not they're true. The first is uh, a thought about inequality from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote in The Social Contract that democracy is only possible in a society where no one is rich enough to buy another and no one so poor as to have to sell himself. And so the question for you to reflect upon is whether or not American society is characterized by a level of inequality that exceeds that definition right now. Um, and the second is by an American, Justice Brandeis, who is, is quoted in Dollarocracy uh, more than once who said that it is possible to have democracy or to have great concentration of wealth, but not both at the same time. And I think that the, um, the authors of Dollarocracy, which you should all run out and buy and read, this is one of the few books that I have actually hard copy and not just electronically, um, uh, it, I think agrees with Justice Brandeis on that theme. Uh, and I won't introduce uh, Rob McChesney and John Nichols, but we'll leave that uh, honor to uh, a fellow at the Shorenstein Center and at the Kennedy School this year, Michael Copps. Uh, Michael is uh, currently a fellow at the Shorenstein Center for Press and Politics, but before that, he's had a long career in public service. Uh, he's worked at the intersection of policy, media, and commerce. He's served two terms as a member of the Federal Communications Commission, from 2001 until 2011. And before that, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary and then Assistant Secretary for Trade Development at the US Department of Commerce in the Clinton administration. Notably, uh, with regard to this theme of media and inequality and wealth and democracy, Mr. Copps cast the only dissenting vote in the FCC decision to approve the merger between Comcast and NBC. He has been critical of the current administration, as well as past administrations, for failing to assure that the airwaves are used to reinforce democratic values rather than undermine them. He has written that, quote, the public sector is at least equally culpable because government, especially the FCC, where I served for more than a decade, blessed just about every media merger and acquisition that came before it. 
Then it proceeded over the better part of a generation to eviscerate almost all of the specific public interest guidelines that had been put in place over many years to ensure that the people's airwaves actually serve the people. Please welcome Michael Copps, who will introduce Robert McChesney and John Nichols. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome all. Thank you to the Ash Center for sponsoring this important event. Thank you to all of you folks here. I know how many things you could be doing this afternoon, how many choices uh, you have. Uh, to events you could have gone to, you made the best possible choice you could have made. I am delighted to be here to introduce two wonderful friends, two great truth tellers, and two people who have done more than anybody I can think of to open the eyes of many Americans to a cancer that's eating at America and to a cancer that's eating out the heart of our democracy and substituting for it what they colorfully and aptly call dollarocracy. The combination of big money, big media, that has succeeded not only in consolidating our media, but dumbing down our civic dialogue and endangering our ability to sustain self-government. So when you talk about challenges to our democracy, this being the first of a series, it's also the most important challenge, I think, that we face right now because so many issues are dependent upon the media. So much depends upon what people understand to be the issues. And instead, we've gotten into, as these gentlemen will tell you, an age where glitzy infotainment substitutes for news, opinion substitutes for fact, and our ability to govern ourselves in an intelligent fashion. Witness where we are today with a shutdown government amidst a country facing so many problems, seriously at risk. Let me let them tell you that story. But let me also recommend, I call this the, the book of the year, and I really think, I really think it is. It's just uh, the result of a tremendous amount of scholarship, a lifetime of learning, and lots of good judgment. Bob McChesney is a prodigious scholar who has written and edited, I think at last count, 23 or 24 books. Absolutely amazing. Each one a revelation. Yes. And... John Nichols uh, is perhaps the hardest driving journalist, one of the most productive ones in the country right now. You've seen him on TV, you've heard him speak, he's a dynamic speaker. Years ago, about the time I went to the FCC in 2001 as a commissioner, I read about this organization that these two folks and another fellow named Josh Silver were starting up called Free Press a citizens action group, a grassroots effort to mobilize Americans to better understand the threat to our democracy that they were talking about. They went out, started the group, organized hundreds of thousands of American citizens to inform them of the problems of the media and to get them involved. And they, they continue, Free Press continues uh, its work uh, to mobilize Americans at the grassroots. Every two years they have a, a wonderful meeting where reformers from all over the United States come to talk about what's going on in their areas, to share experiences and to plot strategy so that we can finally come to terms with the challenge that we face. So we are, are mightily honored to have these uh, two folks with us. Uh, I've had the pleasure of appearing with them at uh, lots of panels uh, in the past. They were kind enough to invite me to a lot of the free press events as we were trying to fight back some bad decision making at the Federal Communications Commission uh, over the last uh, eight or ten years. Uh, I'm honored to call them friends and we're honored to have them here on the Harvard campus. And without further ado, I will let them tell you a story that you need to know. I want you to listen to them. And when you leave here, I want you to ask yourself, what should I do? What can I do? And I think you'll find you can do a lot. Thank you. Uh, so Michael Copps uh, is, you know, one of the people who's actually public servant. 
who actually believed in his job was to protect and promote the public interest, to do so with public participation, follow the letter and spirit of the law. And the reason I, 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 he singled out as on the endangered species is that most of his peers uh, who served with him on the Federal Communications Commission and most of the top staffers, when they leave, go on to careers where they are very lavishly re remunerated. They receive massive incomes, oftentimes in seven figures if they're at the very top. Uh, and they cash in their chip, so to speak. And that reminds us really also of what's taken place in Washington, D.C. in the last 40 years. In 1970, a retiring member of the U.S. Congress, 3% of retiring members would end up working as lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Today, the figure is over 50%. Over 50% of retiring members of Congress go on to work as lobbyists on K Street. If Senator now, the starting salary, this is sort of like sports. They actually call it a draft on K Street. They're going to draft retiring members. We talk about it in the book. And they sort of have a salary cap and a salary scale. So if you're a senator, you get between 800000 and a million and a half. And if you're a member of the House, you get between four hundred and eight hundred thousand, depending what committees you're on, what connections you have. And this is all a part of the dollarocracy mechanism we describe in the book because it's a tremendous disciplinary mechanism uh, on members of regulators, members of commissions, and members of Congress. Because you know, if you play your cards right, your next job, your permanent job, the one where you don't have to worry about elections job, is going to pay you three, four, or five times as much money. So you mind your P's and Q's when you're a regulator, when you're a member of Congress, and you can be set up for life. And that's dollarocracy. That's the new world we're in. And to answer the opening question <coughs> about uh, whether inequality affects democracy, to answer Rousseau's question, well, I think clearly Rousseau would say we flunked that test, uh, that we have, we, we're day way past even being within eyesight, the tame, same time zone of a place where inequality was so low uh, that someone couldn't buy someone else or someone need to sell themselves, their labor to someone else uh, in order to survive. We are, I think, uh, closer and, you know, it is striking that today is the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, which is such a moving speech. I mean, I, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but, uh, pardon? November 19th. Well, it's the anniversary maybe of when it was thought about. The year. Oh, oh, the year. Okay, I thought it was the day. I'm going, wow. Not the very day. Oh, I was going to say, this is incredible. I would have been talking about that all. Well, but the reason it's so important is that that conclusion, you know, moved the nation. Uh, are we of the people, by the people, for the people. And only two decades later, uh, retired President Rutherford B. Hayes, not really in the Hall of Fame of American presidents, uh, but it said something that's very interesting. He was commenting in the 1880s, perhaps the most tumultuous decade in American history, uh, the one where upheaval with regard to capitalism and inequality, the Gilded Age, the, the excesses were most extreme. And Rutherford B. Hayes said, he said basically, uh, we are no longer what Lincoln aspired to. He said, we are a nation of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations uh, in the 1880s. And of course, after the Gilded Age, we had a long period um, of, of social reform, of great struggles from the progressive era to the New Deal through the 1960s, on uh, which many great victories were won, in which we made this a better country in many ways, and in very many important ways. But unfortunately, uh, that, that progress train uh, derailed uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And the train of history moved in a different direction. And it moved us toward what we call dollarocracy. And I think that the name is self-evident, what we're getting at. Instead of democracy, the rule of the people, dollarocracy, the rule of money. One dollar, one vote, rather than one person, one vote. If you've got a lot of dollars, you've got a lot of votes. If you're poor, you have no votes. That's not a complicated concept. And it seems rather extreme, but I think the evidence points out that it's also rather accurate. Uh, in the last two years, uh, leading political scientists have had books published at the Princeton University Press, which have basically confirmed that the federal government of the United States, the Congress, uh, on any decision of, of uh, virtually any decision it makes that has any effect on uh, economic interests, will never represent the interests of the bottom 90% of their constituents. They really have no concern. The decisions are made entirely by what moneyed interests want. Then two weeks ago, we uh, had a chance to do an event like this in Washington to introduce the book. And the person who wrote the foreword to our book, Senator Bernie Sanders, was there. And he, he introduced us graciously, as Mike did today. And Senator Sanders, has, who's been in the Senate now seven years, and before that was in the US House of Representatives for 16 years, said something very interesting. He said, in the Senate today, and this is a declarative statement, it is impossible to pass any legislation that is opposed by Wall Street or large corporations. Emphatically, impossible cannot be done. They have veto power over anything that comes before us. 
Uh, and I think that's what we mean by dollarocracy. Those with the money call the shots. Those without money are on the outside at best spectators uh, to the process. President Jimmy Carter just this last summer, some of you may well know, in the Carter Center in Atlanta, meeting with some German visitors discussing American politics in what he thought was an off-the-record meeting, but thanks to someone's iPhone, became an on-the-record meeting, uh, said that America is no longer a functional democracy. We are off the grid. We're no longer a functional democracy. And you know, the polls sort of get this. And, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to say a glimmer of this because it's in the book, but one of the surveys we found is a rather surprising number of Americans think our system has grown so corrupt that we would be better simply selecting members of Congress by drawing names out of a hat rather than holding elections, that we would have better representation of the American people uh, by jury system. And, you know, it's not that irrational, if you think about it, uh, of an approach to the situation. In our opinion, dollarocracy, uh, one per dollar, one vote, uh, is the defining crisis of our times. It leads to corruption that's self-evident. It promotes and extends inequality. In the U.S. today, it's economic inequality by the Gini index that's used by economists and sociologists and political scientists. The economic inequality of the United States has grown to levels today where we're closer to the Philippines and Malaysia than we are to Western Europe or East Asian countries. We are off the grid again, once again. And I, I come across this literature oftentimes in studying marketing, because marketing people now are saying, we don't have a middle class to sell to anymore. We're, what happened to the great American middle class? We're, we're moving way up to the top of the income level, because those are the only people who have money left to buy our products. This is in the advertising age that you find this literature now. Uh, that's the crisis we face, and that's what dollarocracy gives us. It also gives us economic stagnation. Uh, decline because those at the top have no great incentive to see that there be full employment, that there be high wages. Uh, even though they might benefit in the long run, in the short term they have no apparent interest in those developments. In the book we spend a lot of time talking about um, how since the early 70s this came to be, that there has been a concerted, organized, and in many respects brilliant and certainly effective campaign by corporate interest and conservative interest, but especially business interest, to tame the American political process. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, American business looked out at the American political landscape and was not happy with what it saw. It saw a country in which the stature of business, of corporations specifically, was probably at its low ebb uh, since the Depression. They saw an, a country in which Ralph Nader was the most respected citizen in the entire country across the political spectrum, across the political spectrum. And they saw a situation increasingly young people at, at elite institutions like this People who normally in most countries would be the backbone of the, of the status quo, solid supporters of this state, the business system, were leaders and moved and say, we don't need capitalism anymore. We don't need corporations. They no longer serve a healthy or necessary function. We can do better uh, than the status quo. And they responded strongly and emphatically. Uh, one of the great reports, of course, came from a group called the Trilateral Commission. Uh, which uh, was business leaders in the United States, Europe, and Japan, who were concerned worldwide with the f rise of the new left and what seemed like the threat to business hegemony in their respective countries. And they commissioned a report uh, by one of the authors, was from the sociology department here, Samuel Huntington. And he wrote a report called the, on this very cr situation called the crisis of democracy. And the crisis of democracy facing the United States and the world, according to Huntington and his colleagues, was that there was too much democracy. The problem was that African Americans, women, young people, people who have been traditionally apathetic and on the couches and on the sidelines, were getting too interested in democracy, getting too interested in politics. They were making demands upon the system that the system couldn't meet, and it was screwing up the system. So to have democracy, we had to have less democracy. That was the crisis of democracy, if that makes any sense. But that was what he said. He said, we need those people to go back to their couches. We need to have business take control of society. Uh, in 1971, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was suitably concerned that it commissioned the leading corporate lawyer, or one of the leading corporate lawyers in the U.S., to sort of study this and prepare a confidential memorandum for CEOs of leading corporations. This lawyer made a fortune representing the tobacco industry, <clears throat> and he prepared a short memo, and you can find it online by looking up Lewis Powell Memo 1971. And this, he said that it's time for business to take the gloves off and take over the government again. Increased spending on politics, and sp increased spending on ideological warfare to promote the virtues of business and the lack of virtues of anything that opposes business. And put a lot of money into this and be, be uh, steadfast. Uh, in the two decades following the release of that confidential memo, it spread to corporate leaders. There was a tenfold increase in corporate lobbyists in Washington, D.C. within two decades. 
K Street emerged, a term that didn't exist before 1971, became a Wall Street or Madison Avenue or a Hollywood and Vine in our culture. Uh, and we saw the birth of Heritage, a uh, American Enterprise Institute, Cato, American Legislative Exchange Council, um, Judicial uh, Federal Society, all these institutions, all about promoting the interests and needs of business, their dominant role in our politics, uh, and about creating an intellectual cultural environment more sympathetic to business and more hostile to forces that might get in the way of business. It's one of the things that Lewis Powell said it was desperately needed was to change the federal court system, specifically the Supreme Court, to put people on the bench who were very sympathetic to business and understood the need to take care of business first and foremost in American society. And as fate would have it, two months after this memo was written and distributed, there was an opening on the U.S. Supreme Court. And guess who got appointed? Lewis Powell. And Lewis Powell was called a moderate uh, Southerner. Uh, and in those days, a moderate Southerner meant a white guy who wasn't a member of the Klan. And Lewis Powell uh, was nominated as a moderate Southerner, approved 99 to 1 to the U.S. Senate, only opposed by the great Senator Fred Harris of Oklahoma, who looked at Lewis Powell and said, when I look at that guy, I see someone who doesn't understand the common man. <laughs> I don't like the idea of putting that guy in the court. And instantly upon joining the court, Lewis Powell made it his core mission uh, to have unlimited spending on election campaigns. By labor, true, but mostly by business and by individuals. From the very beginning, it was a central issue of his. And you know, law professors and political scientists have sort of given the moderate Lewis Powell the benefit of the doubt, said, well, he's just trying to make democracy work better. He really cares about having great elections. But I think when you read the Powell memo, it takes on a whole different light. This is a guy who wants to make sure we don't have great elections, who wants to make sure that business can dominate elections in any way possible to limit their ability to represent the interests of the mass of people. Uh, he didn't get his way. William Rehnquist was opposed to his view on election reform, uh, but when William Rehnquist left and was replaced by Federal Society darling John Roberts, everything changed. John Roberts was Lewis Powell with vigor, vim, and we came up with the 2010 Citizens United decision, which did much of what Paul wanted, not all of it, but much of it. And a decision which oftentimes is pointed to is the great problem we have in America today, was the unleashing of the third party groups, which effectively became anonymous third party groups, dark money, to flood uh, uh, campaigns with money and to create advertising. Now, I think Larry Lessig is right uh, when Larry says that Citizens United fired a bullet into the body of American democracy, but the body was already cold. I mean, it was, we were well down the track long before Citizens United. But Citizens United did lead in 2012 to an election in which we spent, by our calculation, on federal and local races, uh, 12, $10 billion. That's about double what was spent in 2008, about 10 times what was spent uh, 20 years earlier, 24 years earlier, factoring in inflation. Enormous increases in spending on elections. And, uh, What's striking about this is if we compare what America spends compared to other countries. Uh, we just had an election in Germany last week, major national election. In Germany, uh, for every dollar spent in Germany by campaigns, politicians to promote people to vote for them, for every dollar that was spent in Germany in our national elections, just counting congressional and presidential in 2012, we spent $32. We spent 32 times more than Germany on our national election. Well, we must have had a much better election if we spent a lot more on it, right? That makes perfect sense. Imagine if we spent 32 times more on early childhood education than Germany spends on their children. We'd have the greatest childhood education system known to the human race. You know, every school class would have like one teacher, three students, and a couple tutors, a personal trainer, a masseuse. Imagine 32 times what Germany spends on early child education. So if we spent 32 times as much on elections, we must really be knocking it over the fence. Well, no, with elections, it's just the opposite. The more money you spend, the more bogus it is. And that's, in the book we go into great detail, I'll just give a couple quick points why uh, that are worth pointing out. Uh, first of all, um, there's a great difference. All this is lost on, well, not really lost on Lewis Powell. He understood it, but it's lost in the rhetoric surrounding this issue. Uh, between the money that a person who gives $50 or $100 or $200 because they believe in an idea or cause and might help a candidate and gives hard-earned money to that candidate, from someone who reaches into their spare change drawer for $150 million to secretly fund a uh, campaign against a referendum or for a referendum or for a candidate. There's a major difference. And most of the, the big spenders like to be quiet. They don't really want to advertise what they're doing. But fortunately for us, uh, there are a few hot dogs out there 
who we can learn from. And certainly hot dog number one from the 2012 race was a gentleman named Shelley Adelson from Las Vegas, Nevada, who spent roughly $150 million trying to influence the last election. And after the uh, campaign, Shelley Adelson, in a very revealing interview, I think it's with the Washington Post, I'm not sure. Yeah. And what, he was in Washington doing a victory lap and having people fawn all over him in the Republican Party. And so Adelson said, look, I'm for socialized medicine. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I believe in same-sex marriage. I think climate change is a real problem. I believe in stem cell research. I believe in evolution. But, and I'm paraphrasing. I'm reading a little bit between the lines. But he said all that. But when I invest in politics, I'm concerned about, I hate labor unions. I don't want to pay taxes. And I'm doing some fishy stuff over in Asia. And I'd really rather not have the government look too closely at what I'm doing there. So I want politicians in power who sort of look the other way when my name comes up on the file. And so I'm going to spend a lot of money because I'm worth $30 billion and I want to be worth $60 billion. I don't want to be worth $10 billion and be in jail. So for him, it's an investment. It's an investment. He was voted, if he was giving money like any of us would, a, a person who gives $100, he'd be a socialist. The Green Party would be flush with money. But he's making an investment to move the bottom line. That's what all this money is about, to protect class interests, commercial interests, narrow self-interest. That's what this money is. It's completely different from the little $50, $100, $150 campaign donation. The second point is that where does all this money go? All this money goes, six billion of the 10 billion goes to political advertising. The vast majority of that TV political advertising is negative political advertising. It's difficult to exaggerate how toxic this is. We take it for granted this is the natural way elections are done. It isn't. They're done nowhere else in the world like this. Germany doesn't have political advertising. Norway doesn't have political advertising. Britain doesn't have political advertising. They certainly don't have negative TV political advertising. They don't have that. This is our, this is our lingua franca for us. 80 to 90% of all our candidate ads now are negative attack ads. They're toxic. All they are is really voter suppression mechanisms to turn people off to politics, turn people off to candidates. There's really no place for them, in our view. Uh, but they are now the lingua franca. And they're the lingua franca, lastly, because we no longer have journalism. We no longer have journalism, which is the truly great story of our times, the collapse and disintegration of the commercial model of journalism. The resources are plummeting. They're not coming back because in the era of smart advertising, advertising will no longer need to support content online. So that's why journalism online will not get sufficient support from advertising. And we have to face a society up to the fact that advertising requires a public policy solution if we're going to have it, much like we had in the first century of this country when we had massive postal and printing subsidies that gave us the greatest newspaper uh, system in the world. So that's the great crisis we're in. Uh, we, I've just touched on a few of the points in the book. I'm looking forward to the Q&A, but before we get there, I want to turn it over to my beloved co-author, John Nichols. Um, let me begin by, by uh, jumping on the uh, former Commissioner Copps is the greatest guy who ever served in government train and, uh, and tell you that, that he, he walks among you and so you would obviously treat him with the disrespect that we always treat those who are around us. But uh, you really ought to pause and take this guy in. Because I will tell you that if you study the history of this country, and you say, OK, who from the, the Roosevelt era on came into government and actually tried to serve in a regulatory role with the, the purpose that was intended not with the purpose of getting a really good job on K Street or a really good job with a corporation. It's Michael Copps. I tell you, there's a handful of others, but this is such a small group of people who actually serve in regulatory roles with the purpose of defending the public interest. I mean, you can just, you, you know, Robert Rice just did his Inequality for All documentary. I think, I, I think my next project is going to be the Copps documentary walk him through this process, because he's an epic figure, and I'm very honored to be here with him. Um, so we don't have a lot of time uh, to belabor our points before you say very wise things and ask very wise questions. But let me uh, get to one key thing uh, in our book, which is this concept of a money and media election complex. A money and media election complex. And it, where do we get this phrase? Well, obviously, we borrowed it from Dwight Eisenhower at the end of his tenure, Dwight Eisenhower looked at the thing that frightened him the most as a former general, as a former commander of allied forces. What frightened him absolutely the most, what troubled him, was the notion that in the United States, we had a military-industrial complex 
that would define this country into wars and into ill-thought international policies, not, not for the national interest and not for national security, but because it made them money. No, no, don't, don't gloss over this. Eisenhower talked about it throughout his presidency. 1953, his first great speech, said every time we build a missile, that's a school that doesn't get built. There's very few people who understood so well the reality of our military spending as a threat to our domestic economy and also to our domestic freedom as Dwight Eisenhower. Military man, he understood. We said, well, what's the threat today? Well, we still got the military industrial complex. There's no doubt of that. But the money and media election complex is, to our view, the domestic equivalent, as much a threat and as much an undermining force. So how does it work? What is the, what's the dynamic here? Well, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but, but the one thing, and Bob sort of touched on this, I'm going to absolutely emphasize this because it goes against an awful lot of the thinking, certainly of the political class in this country, and frankly, of an element of academia. The more money in politics, the less democracy. Very vital thing to understand. And, and because a healthy, thriving democracy where people are highly engaged and highly informed, they don't need a lot of ads to tell them who to vote for, right? They're, they're going down, they're, they're going to the League of Women Voters event. They're you know, reading the paper, they're checking everything. They know what to do. It's only as your disengagement rises that you need more money to reach those people, right? Because you aren't gonna reach them through their affirmative acts of engaging with democracy. You're going to interrupt their lives on a regular basis with advertisements, which of course the Norwegian government, Norwegians understand and refer to it correctly as propaganda. They said you, would never, you can't have advertisements before an election. That would be absurd. If, you just, if, if election debate was driven by advertisements, you, you wouldn't, people wouldn't be able to get useful information. Why, there's a possibility they might even lie. <laughs> so, I mean, that would be absurd. It would be crazy. You, you would flood your TV with advertisements before an election. That would be absolute madness. And you say, well, this is what the people want. How many people do you know said, yeah, I want to be watching American Idol, and then I want an ad on there that tells me how horrible my senator is. I want to be watching, you know, whatever, that's American Idol's the extent of my TV experience, but, but uh, I want to be watching whatever other show is on, and I want it to be interrupted by something that tells me that the person I was going to vote for is essentially the devil incarnate. Right? I mean, not, 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 that's a little soft, I realize, but let's just say the devil incarnate. And, and I'll tell you how bad it is. I had a friend who's running for Congress up in, uh, up in northern Wisconsin. He was a rich guy. He, was a, he did some kind of, I don't even think what it was. He's like, fix something. I, oh, pimples. Yeah, he's a doc, pimple doctor, right? He popped your zits and made a fortune. Anyway, so he made enough money to run for Congress. And, and he's financing his own campaign. And I ran into him about a week or so before the election. I said, how's it going? He said, ah, it's a tough day. So what do you mean? My opponent went on TV saying that one of the stands I took uh, causes child molesters to come into our neighborhoods, you know, because he had said he'd stood for some kind of freedom thing or whatever. So he said, so he said basically got an ad on saying, like, I'm a friend, friends with child molesters. And, and I said, that's going to cost me another $350,000, $400,000. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm self-financing my campaign, so I'm going to have to buy another $350,000, $400,000 to go on TV to say, well, he's worse than somebody who is friends with child molesters. And so at the end of the day, this is what our politics is. It isn't about, it's not about illumination. It's not about making you a better citizen. It's not about engaging you with our politics. It is about, it is about open warfare, winner take all, because in an election, 51% is everything. There's no 49 percent you did okay, right? We love George McGovern, but you know. So the bottom line is, bottom line is our politics, winner take all politics, and we have a money and media election complex that plays off that. And it is on the march. Because amazingly enough, the entire American story is about two things: expanding the franchise, founding the republic, about four to six percent of people could vote, white men. They would gather in a room like this, not much bigger than this. They would decide who represented them in Congress. They picked senators even easier. Of course, they had an appointed Senate, so 
basically a rich guy would bribe some people and then become a senator, which is a little bit like today, but you know, we, we've at least run it through an election now. And so the bottom line is, the bottom line is it's expansion of the franchise, and then the battle of those who are, whose po economic position is weakened by an expansion of the franchise to figure out other ways, other means to control the process. Simple, simple storyline. Well, we've pulled the constraints off the money and media election complex. We've actually, we've actually systematized it and made it easier for it to do its job. And how do we do that? Well, we have made it so easy to flood so much money into politics that it's almost ridiculous. We talk, in, in, in working on this book, we spent three years looking at our election processes. We started in 2010 and we said, okay, we're just going to take a deep breath. We're going to spend three years looking at how we elect a president, how we elect a Congress, how we do our politics. Talk to a lot of rich people along the way. Bob illustrates some with some of his comments. But this is an interesting thing that we learned about it. Nobody wants to give as much money as they want to give in America today is in any way constrained from doing so. I want to, you know, we have some campaign finance laws on the book. We've got tax laws. We've got you know, the 501c3, 4, 5, 6 laws. But the fact of the matter is, you want, to, you want to put a lot of money into politics, you can do it. How much? Well, I'll give you an example. A couple weeks ago, the Koch brothers, our friends from Kansas via New York, the Koch brothers and their operation revealed that in 2012, they spent 200, and, they and their friends and allies, spent $236 million that we didn't know about when we were doing our book. $236 million that we didn't know about. So add that on the figure about 10.2. Yeah. And, what, and they revealed it because finally, after the whole election process is done, after everything's finished, then they have to do some tax filings that reveal what they did. And it turns out there was this huge messaging project of which roughly $115 million went to discrediting Obamacare. Well, isn't that ironic? In fact, if you look at all the spending that they did, spreading money all over the country, not just them, but their allies, you start to realize, is it outside chance that there's nobody who's against Obamacare? That the, uh, that the entire thing is a manufactured reality? And, you, and I say, well, you say, well, no, there's a poll show this. Well, yeah, but where would people be if they just had, had clean information? Where would they be if they were just reading the data, working it out themselves? Would there really be massive opposition? Would it really be a thing that brought our government to a standstill? Or would it be a man, is it a manufactured reality? Do the wealthiest people in America have the ability to manufacture political reality? That's what we say a money and media election complex does, because it flows so much money in, floods that money in. It actually has the ability to animate dead ideas, to take an idea that has been defeated by the American people and make it live or at least a zombie. And the, we have walking among us today zombie ideas. The ideas that have been defeated at the polls that nobody likes, but we're still debating it. Give you an example, privatizing Social Security. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it, right? I mean, I tell you, you just go across this country, and we have north, south, east, west. You find somebody who says, yeah, I really think Wall Street's where I want my Social Security. Right? No, I mean, they're like, ah, ixnay on the All Street way. You know, it's like, it's madness, right? And yet, the idea walks among us. Why? Because Pete Peterson, a very, very wealthy man, has literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars to fix the debt, right? And so we have these, we, this constant flow of money. It makes ideas that we have rejected as the people part of our politics. Not because we want it in a part of our politics, not because we as informed citizens would choose it as such, but because in this circumstance, they can do it. Well, how can they do it? This is the important thing. It's not just the ads. It's not just the money. Their money would mean a lot, but we've always had money in this country. Lots of money in our politics. It's, Gilded Age was, was certainly not a noble era uh, as regards campaign spending. But you know what we, we used to have? A diverse and energetic and combative media. And our media has stood down. And our media is now a collection agency for the money and media election complex. Takes in all this revenue. Do you know what the best way to, you know what the most successful television station in America is? Cops knows this. It's a station in a battleground state, in a competitive state, because now campaign ads are actually a major profit center for TV stations. We recently, there was recently articles where they're talking about how stations that are up for sale, if you're in a battleground state, you get, you're of higher value. Because Coke and Pepsi 
they're already in your phone. They're following you on the internet. They don't need, they don't need TV as much anymore. Pepsi pulled off the Super Bowl. Ah, they don't do that. TV ads and politics, TV ads and politics are the boom industry. Filling the void, because adverti most advertising is going elsewhere, because our electorate is older. Our electorate tends to be folks who watch TV. You know, it's a very, the dynamic is very real. It's not even, no, no revelation to political scientists. And so it works, right? This is what's happened. And instead, of, we actually detail it in the book, TV stations in major markets that shave time off their newscast to make room for more ads, right? And we have also tons of data that'll tell you that TV covers less politics today than it, has, than it did in the past. It'd be just incredible collapse. We tell stories in the book about elections for major offices where there was no reporting on the election. And then when the guy who had potentially a history of wife beating and drug abuse gets, buys the lieutenant governor nomination in Illinois, and then it comes out after the election, the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times both had columns in which they said, eh, maybe we should have covered that race. But the fact is they don't. We've lost in this country tens of thousands of newspaper reporters just in the last five years. Tens of thousands of reporters and other newspaper employees. Detailed a wonderful study, a wonderful operation called Paper Cuts. Uh, we've lost since the Telecommunications Act of 1996 an estimated 20,000 on-air radio personalities replaced by syndicated radio Rush Limbaugh. We have lost on television immense numbers of political reporters, investigative reporters. You used to have I-teams on every TV station. Most of America doesn't have an I-team anymore. But they got two weather people. You know, so in case you're missing the weather, you could get that. So the bottom line is that this thing is not working well. It's a crisis. And you know what the interesting measure of it is? People don't vote anymore. I know, we have elections and we get all excited about it. We had a, we had a wonderful New York Times story. 1963, in New York City, there was a primary. And the New York Times wrote, they're thinking it might be a very low turnout. Very low turnout. Only 2 million of the 2.7 million eligible voters may vote. Well, we just had an incredibly competitive mayoral primary in New York City. And I think the turnout was in the range of 700,000. We have an incredible, striking standing down of the electorate. Our turnout is a disaster in this country. There is nobody who gets elected to office where they can say they have in any kind of major office where they can say they have the support of the majority of the voting age population where they ran. So this, is, there's, this isn't working. It's not working well. In the book we say that when you get in this kind of situation, you ought to take the advice of Tom Paine. Tom Paine said, you get in a bad situation in this country, think of yourself as a founder. Don't think of yourself as somebody inherited. Think of yourself as a founder. A founder looks at the problem and says, how do we solve it? The way we solve the problems of the United States today is by addressing constitutional flaws. And this is, this is the kind of core message of how we begin to address things. We've got to get comfortable with constitutional amendments, the same way that our ancestors were, same way that we've amended the Constitution 27 times. We amended the Constitution to give women the vote. We amended the Constitution to end the poll tax, the wealth barrier to voting. We ended, amended the Constitution to give 18 to 21 year olds votes. We've amended the Constitution again and again and again to expand democracy. Today, we have to amend our Constitution to get money out of politics. It is as simple as that. It's not a complicated idea. And I want to emphasize to you, it's afoot in America. Now, if you watch the TV news, watch the evening. No, it's not that hard. We do it all the time. You know, the founders amended the Constitution 10 times within four years of writing it. Then they amended it again less than 15 years later because the vice president shot the secretary of the treasury and they thought they had to have a better way of picking vice president. The fact of the matter is we amend the Constitution all the time to fix problems. And yet today we're told, well, that, ugh, it's impossible. Well, here's the bottom line about amending the Constitution of the United States. It is not impossible. Hap it has happened all the time. It has happened every time that we've moved forward as a society in the last hundred years. And anybody who doesn't think that it's possible is dooming us to live under an ever-expanding money and media election complex. Of course we should amend the Constitution to say money isn't speech, corporations are not people, and we the people of this country have a right to organize a democracy that functions for everybody. We should amend the Constitution to say also that everybody has a right to vote and to have that vote counted, because Antonin, Antonin Scalia says we don't. Let's do it. And I know, I know, if you watch the news, you think that's impossible and it's not happening. It is happening. The most dynamic movement in America today is the movement to amend the Constitution. It's not the Tea Party. I'm sorry, if you live in Washington, you think the Tea Party does everything. That, that is not reality. 
Out in America, there are millions of Americans who are trying to amend our Constitution right now. 16 American states have already petitioned Congress formally to amend the Constitution to get money out of politics. 16 American states have already done that. 500 American communities, Los Angeles, Chicago, others, have formally petitioned the Congress of the United States to amend the Constitution to get money out of politics. You will not find a more dynamic and engaged movement. Right here in Boston, there is a woman here with a move to amend pin on her. I don't know where she said. There she is. Lovely woman in the corner back there. And they have, she would de delight, be delighted if you would come and talk to her about her rally for democracy. And so the fact of the matter is, and I, why do I tell you that? It's not just to promote that very nice woman there. It is to tell you, we never go into a room where there isn't somebody working on this. We never go into a room where there aren't lots of people working on this. This is the dynamic reality of our politics. The people are in open revolt. The people are ready to change this thing. The problem is that they're not paid attention to. We don't have a media system that covers politics anymore. We don't have a media system that covers governmental debates anymore. It's a crisis. And to fix that system, we got to get the money out of politics. So it's chicken and the egg, chicken and the egg. But the fact of the matter is, you now know what the egg is. The egg is a constitutional amendment. It can, it can hatch into something fundamentally better for this country. And if you don't believe that we can do it, I'll close with this thought. Back in 1910, if you looked out across this country, you would see a country where poor girls worked as bobbin girls in mills. Sometimes their fingers got chopped off in the machines. Where women worked in factories where um, they worked on the 10th, 11th floor. And if the factory caught on fire, they ran to the door to try and run down to safety. They found the door locked because you're not supposed to work. You couldn't, couldn't take a break during your 10, 12-hour shift. That wasn't Bangladesh. That was the United States. Those women jumped to their death outside the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. The fact of the matter is, this country in the Gilded Age had a huge mess. And what do we do in 10 years? We amended the Constitution to give those women the vote. We amended the Constitution to end an appointed Senate and begin an elected Senate. And we amended the Constitution to give our government the taxing power and the taxing, the taxing structures that ultimately would give us the basis for a new deal and also all the social reforms that came after. We did it in a 10-year period. The only question that we would suggest to you is, are you less than the Americans of 100 years ago? Has the money and media com election complex grown so big and so strong? Has it bought your minds so effectively that you can't do the reform that working class people went and did 100 years ago. We don't think you're less. We think you can go out and do it. And frankly, we think if you don't, the country you give to your children will be dramatically less than the one you inherited. Thank you. <clears throat> now, uh, do we answer Sam? Well, what format would you tell prefer? us what to do? Uh, we can do it another way. Uh, why don't I call on people just to make it a little, little simpler? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so thank you. Please identify yourself. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, my name is James Williamson. I happen to be a candidate for city council here in Cambridge. Excellent. And so that actually is not just a cheap uh, way of making a plug, but to connect what you're talking about to local elections, where I actually think the best opportunities are and maybe have been for a while. In a local election like Cambridge, a city of 105,000 people, some of the things you're talking about aren't an issue. The money, yes, is an issue because you can buy a campaign manager, you can buy direct mail, uh, help with targeting, and uh, all the signs that are placed in, in buildings that are owned by somebody, not lived in by anybody. Um, but there are opportunities if you go door to door. Um, you can actually have a chance locally in spite of all of this that you're talking about that I, I agree with you, we need to to change and, and, and defeat. So what about in the local, what about the opportunities locally? That's great, we, it's a terrific question. I'll take a piece of it and yeah. then bring Bob in. Uh, and I'm gonna stand up because I actually like to see you. I know you probably don't care about seeing me, but um, I, in our book we devote an immense amount of space to local elections because we think that's the boom area for the money and media election complex. Uh, we found city council races in San Jose, California that cost as much as a half million dollars for a local city council race. We found county board races in which some of the wealthiest people in America in the Las Vegas area were flooding money into those races. The fact of the matter is, when the wonderful people at Open Secrets did their study that said that the 2012 election campaign cost $6 billion, and it was a revelation, all the headlines said it was a $6 billion campaign, 
and we thought, wow, that's an immense amount of money, then we started doing our research based on that. We accept their $6 billion for the federal races, but they don't study local and state races. Fact is that you can find another $4 billion, roughly $4 billion in spending in state and local races. In California alone, $550 million, $550 million more than we spent on presidential races until recent years, $550 million was spent just on referendums. The fact of the matter is that money has been freed to flood into every open space, and it is ridiculous to think that local elections are going to be free of that. The fact of the matter is that in some communities where you have a skewed politics, a left, a right, it will be harder. But in communities, particularly suburban areas, we are already seeing stunning examples of money flowing in to elections with the purpose simply of changing a law so that somebody can make more money. It is, it is the boom area, and it is also a boom area because our media covers local less than Washington. Washington gets a lot of coverage. Statehouse gets a little. Local, especially in suburban areas, almost none. That's good enough, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Barry Gertsen. I'm a research fellow at the Kennedy School's Women in Public Policy Program. Um, I'm actually Swiss where we um, amend our constitution four yes. times a year. So. And very easily. <laughs> I should have used you as an example, yeah. Um, so I was wondering, what, what is the potential role that you see for social media? Because you said there's not enough coverage on official media outlets on these issues, do, do you see a, do you see a big role for social media? Do you think that's not necessarily read by those who would then actually go on and vote, or how do you well, see that role? I think social media uh, can be very valuable, and in certain contexts, it's invaluable for people doing political work to communicate and, and to stay in touch with each other. The the limitation of social media, though, is that it's not journalism; it's not reporting. I mean, it's and that's what's the, tragically absent. That's what we're missing is the uh, people covering beats, competing, accountable for beats, covering politics, uh, drawing people into issues, what journalism should do in a, in a healthy democratic society. So I think tweeting would be a hundred times more impressive if there was a base of great journalism to play off of, to tweet to great stories, to draw people in. But in and of itself, uh, I think it, it, it can be valuable, but we shouldn't exaggerate it as a panacea. I, I tweeted a picture of cops at the start of this thing. Yeah. You know, and, and I think like two people retweeted it. So it's a <laughs> powerful thing. Uh, let me just qu quickly, social media works where you have a highly engaged group of people who are already kind of deeply in the process. Our concern is that we have such a disengaged reality in America that social media speaks to the people in your circle who are already there. Uh, and it, it is not, a, at this point, to our view, a solution to the problem. It is a useful organizing tool. Uh, when we watched the Wisconsin uprising, the rebellion there, where literally hundreds of thousands of people came into the streets. That was driven by social media, so things can happen there. The Tea Party actually uses social media very, very well, and more power to them for that. And so it's there, but for informing and engaging an electorate, uh, no, I think it, in many ways, unfortunately, to my view at this point, it reinforces the silo that people are already in. Hi, uh, my name is Gabe Hakeem. I'm a joint Kennedy School and um, Stanford Graduate School of Business candidate. Um, and I really, one, thank you for so much for being here. Two, I appreciate you using the quote from uh, Mr. Lawrence Lessig. Uh, I found his book a couple years ago to be the most intriguing one that I read that entire year. Um, and I'm intrigued by the idea of a constitutional amendment to help solve the problem with money in politics. But building off the question that, that you just asked and, and some of what you just responded, which is that that doesn't actually improve necessarily an informed no. electorate. And I haven't read your book yet, and I look forward to doing it. But I was wondering if you guys also have thoughts on if that's a trap that we can get out of as well. It's a great question. I'm going to answer it briefly and then let Bob take more of it because it's his great area of scholarship. But um, you're exactly right. We do not believe that a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics is going to solve our problems. You know, some people want to amend the Constitution to get rid of the Citizens United ruling, just to specifically focus on that. And that will take us back to the glorious days of 2009. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, at this point, we, and we studied this very seriously. We have chapters on the court and on, on the structural challenges that exist. We believe a constitutional amendment is necessary. It's sort of a gateway to begin to, to try and get a clause back to a point where we can solve other problems. And the problem of an informed electorate uh, is a separate crisis that feeds into this one, and it will require, uh, frankly, 
some radical endeavors which are not do not require a constitutional amendment, but do require a different politics. And for the answer to what we might suggest, I'll turn to Bob. Well, yeah, that's my job. Mr. Answer Man. Uh, I think the, the collapse of journalism specifically, an informed electorate, is the great single communication crisis of our time. And it is absolutely a part of dollarocracy. Uh, I mean, it's a central component. And to get rejuvenate democratic institutions, reviving a modern fourth estate is right at the center of everything. Uh, it was at the center of the framing of the, of the Constitution in this country. I mean, the, Madison and Jefferson were obsessed with this issue. They understood its central importance, and it has to be returned there. The great problem we face is that journalism is a public good. It's something this society desperately needs that the market won't produce in sufficient quality or quantity. Advertising for 125 years disguised that public good nature because it made journalism very profitable. It provided 50 to 100 percent of the revenues, and people made vast fortunes in doing commercial journalism. Well, advertising has gone away now. It, in the new era of smart advertising, you don't support content producers. You buy your demographics online through an internet network, and that's money's rapidly going that direction digitally. So newspapers that got 100 percent of their ad revenues in 2003 on their online activities only got 20 percent of their ad revenues in 2010. The rest went to the network. It's under 10% today. This is, that's why Rupert Murdoch gave up on internet journalism. He, he abandoned his effort to have the daily, that was going to be the iPad newspaper. He just said, I give up. I can't make, it won't work. The numbers don't add up. It's why the Guardian said, once they burn through the money they make from their print edition that, that generates all the revenues, that subsidizes the uh, E-edition, the, the internet edition, if they once they lose the print edition, they don't know how they're possibly going to sustain themselves. They simply don't have a model that will work. It's a public good. The commercial model's dead. And here's what the point John made that's so important. You know, we actually have had this. Before advertising became a central part of American journalism in the very end of the 19th century, we had the most dynamic print media in the world, independent, uncensored, feisty, um, robust. And we did because we instituted enormous printing and postal subsidies the first century of American history to make it much less expensive and to, to, to run a newspaper, to start a newspaper, and much easier to distribute. And it was an enlightened subsidy because it didn't favor one viewpoint over another. It just made it easier to have more newspapers. When Tocqueville came here in the 1830s, he was astounded at the range of newspapers compared to France or Britain or Canada. He said, in America, it seems like everyone's starting a newspaper. And he said there's a direct relationship between the amount of equality in a society and the number of newspapers. It was a brilliant policy. I think we need that sort of thinking today. We've got to think, what can we do to spawn a nonprofit, non-commercial, independent, uncensored, uh, competitive news media? And the, you know, I just came back from Europe where you know, there, uh, they're greatly concerned because they see this as happening there. Now, they have a firewall there in a way, or they're buffered because they have extensive public media that's highly respected, particularly in Northern Europe. So they have newsrooms there already, so they're not having the same place, but they can see the commercial model collapsing at the same time. In this country, unfortunately, we're still, we don't have that public media support. We're sort of standing naked with this crisis. But we're deluded because people look at the internet, and you Google something, it seems like there's 500,000 articles on some subject. But when you actually look at it, the actual amount of actual journalism being done today is, is almost non-existent. It's fairly small. And so we've got to somehow come to up with solutions. I think there are ways to do this, looking at our past, looking at other countries. Uh, but we've got to have an open debate. We've got to study. We've got to take it seriously. Commissioner Copps knows when he was at the FCC uh, that this was something the FCC actually appointed a, a commission mm -hmm. to study the crisis of journalism because they saw this happening. And they issued actually a pretty good report that had great research on just the extent of the crisis. The FTC also appointed a commission at the same time to study the crisis of journalism and say, what are some public policy solutions so we can actually have journalism again? They see it there. Uh, their, their report did not get published due to political pressure from the far right. That's another issue we could talk about. But the point is, this is not a problem that's going away. It's a problem we have to study, and it has to be solved. And I think American scholars uh, have, have not been up to this job yet. It's, and so it's a pet issue of mine to try to make people talk about this and deal with it more. Please. Oh, I'm of Alex Kesar, and I. Of course. Um, and I, I agree with everything, but, um, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm glad we were able to work this out that you could come. But, but I, I have a question about the emphasis uh, in terms of try, trying to mobilize people about the emphasis on constitutional sure. amendments. Absolutely. Um, back in ancient history of 2000, 2001, I began working with Congressman Jackson on a, on a constitutional amendment. 
We were there, yeah. You vote, and in fact, I wrote some of the drafts of that, uh, you know, of that amendment. And I think I wrote every article about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was part of the problem was that you were the only person. I was writing, the only one. Yeah, yeah. The only person writing yeah. articles about it, but I, you know, you know, I, I was very young in two thousand one, um, and you know, <laughs> um, and I sort of thought, well, a constitutional amendment to guarantee the right to vote. Right. Be easy. Who's who's going to oppose that? Right. This is like mom, dad, and you know, and apple pie. Um, X years later, you know, there were still at most 44 sponsors in the House, and nobody in the Senate, including Barack Obama, oh, yeah. was willing to step up and be a, sp a sponsor uh, in the Senate. You know, and, and the historical record. I mean, I, again, I appreciated the upbeat tone of looking at the period between 1910 and 1920, but. You know, the drive to amend the Constitution for women's suffrage started in 1850. Um, and, you know, we, we've averaged about eight amendments per century uh, after, the, after the Bill of Rights. So I'm, the, the analytic question here is, can you see a particular, a particular way in which the forces that you are describing will not necessarily block any yeah. effort at a constitutional amendment in the foreseeable future? Is there some Absolutely. prediction that might emerge that might, might it seem possible? Absolutely. And uh, first off, thank you for your work. It, was, it, it is quoted in our book, and it is treated with great respect because we see it as essential. And here's the answer to the, your question. It's a very simple one. Right, we, you're right. We have about eight constitutional amendments a century, but they tend to come in packs, and they tend to come at moments where we've reached a critical juncture. That's why I tell, when I speak about constitutional amendments, whether I do it at Harvard or in a church basement, which we were, at, we were in, out at one yesterday, and we do it, we're, this tour has taken us to all sorts of different places. I always tell the story of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. You know, the fact is that in the Gilded Age, the Gilded Age went along for quite a while, but as you had a rise of social movements and, a, and actually a media, a muckraking media, that started to highlight these things, people started to get really angry. Anger is wonderful. Anger is the critical factor. And in 2001, Jesse Jackson Jr. and others thought that people would be angry enough about the 2000 election to do something about it. I was with Jesse Jackson Jr., who's tragically had some bad things happen in his life, but is, I think, a very innovative thinker. Uh, I was with him when he announced his constitutional amendment. I was at that event at the court, at Supreme Court. But do you know when he did that? Two months after September 11th. It was doomed from the start because you were literally trying to raise an issue of the legitimacy of a sitting president who had 91% popularity. Simple realities. Politics is politics. I believe the moment we are in, I think Citizens United and its aftermath has unleashed something quite remarkable in America. The woman, there's a woman sitting right behind you, literally right behind you, and she wasn't there for your amendment. But she's there now. And I want to tell you this. This is a big deal. We never go anywhere where she is not or her equivalent. And sometimes they are young and sometimes they are old. Sometimes they are male. Sometimes they are female. But they are all over this country. And I, I, it's critical junctures are the key. And here's the other thing. We tell you about 1910 to 1920. 1960 to 1970 started with a ban on the poll tax in a constitutional amendment. Then the Supreme Court came in, one person, one vote. Do you really think the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act would have had the same meaning if you hadn't had a ban on the poll tax and then the one person, one poll vote ruling, these huge epic things? And that, that decade ended by giving 18 to 21 year olds the vote. So the fact of the matter is we reach moments where it's right to act. If we're wrong and this moment isn't it, then we're going to have to wait till it comes because it isn't going to get better. I'll just quickly add to that, uh, to reinforce what John said, two things. I mean, the crucial thing is if we are going to have a moment of ref the reforms we're talking about, it will take a great upsurge of political involvement. And I think we're seeing glimmers of that. Uh, we've seen it in the last few years. And it will be a moment like the 60s, like the 30s and 40s with the New Deal, like the Progressive Era, and like the Reconstruction. And what we see in all those eras, there were a number of constitutional amendments passed. Everyone thought they were impossible five years before they were passed. Five years after they passed, everyone said, oh, yeah, what took them so long? Uh, that's how constitutional amendments are. If we're going to have the sort of reform period in America that will address the inequality mm -hmm. directly, the, threaten, the, the, the purpose of this series, if we're going to have that uh, reform movement, 
history suggests we will have a bunch of constitutional amendments. That was one of the ways you know you're in a reform moment. You have the, the sufficient support that you get that. And if we don't have constitutional amendments, it probably means we're going to be having this conversation, our children will be having it, uh, if they're fortunate enough to be at the Kennedy School. The other point I'd make, the work around constitutional amendments can be effective even if you don't win them. They're wonderful for rallying people, giving them the imagination to think of a different world and to put their energy into it and creating space then for legislative efforts to follow in their wake. You know, we lost the ERA, but we won Title IX. We won a number of victories for women's rights, and a lot of that came out of the organizing around the ERA. So even though it didn't win, there's a lot to show for it that made it valuable organizing work and drawing women and men into politics who might not have been involved otherwise. I mean, I, I, we're popcorn in it here, so I promise I'm going <laughs> to yeah. take this very short. We're big mouths. I, this very, very short one thing on constitutional amendments. You often, we treat constitutional amendments in hindsight as irrelevant. We don't even think of but there were two constitutional amendments in the, in the 1930s, in the New Deal era. One moved when a president is sworn in from March to January. Another moved when the new Congress sat from way deep into the next year right up to January. You want to understand how the New Deal happened? You want to talk about inequality. You want to talk about fundamental uh, people get mad, they elect a government, and that government does something. Those constitutional amendments, which we now don't even, most people don't even know they were done, they cleared the way for most of the history that we saw. So we just emphasize to people, don't delink constitutional amendments from the things we learn about in our history classes. Understand that they are usually the gateway to the other things that come. Yeah, Lee Edger, I'm a Shorenstein fellow as well. I am, and I'm working on uh, campaign spending. But, oh, uh, can you hear me? Lee Edger, I'm a Shorenstein fellow. I'm confused about something about Citizens United, and I shouldn't be at this point in my research, but um, you've, you guys see more data than I do. People often elide, and they often talk about corporate money mm -hmm. in campaigns. But what I've seen is the individual money of yes. billionaires, yeah. and I haven't found a lot of corporate money. I mean, you know, the Coke, Coke Industries is privately held. But you don't see General Mills, mm -hmm. uh, Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay. So for one thing, I want to clear up that confusion. I'm, wonder, I'm also wondering whether the reason you don't see corporate money that way is that they're afraid of some you know, shareholder actions or some fiduciary problems. Well, number one, is it true that the corporations aren't writing checks? And if so, yeah. what's the reason they're not writing them? Why don't you hold that question if you want to follow up. Uh, the corporations are not writing checks in the same way. Now, there's an interesting subtlety. Shelley Adelson, who we speak about a lot, it's one of our favorite things in the book. Shelley Adelson, in all, spent about $200 million in state, local, and federal races in 2012. And then, at the end of the year, he gave himself, from his corporation, a $1.2 billion bonus. Now, it, those were personal contributions, mind you, but uh, we shouldn't necessarily delink them from the corporate reality. Um, and when we do our chapter, so many people like Citizens United as a reference point, and it did kind of alert a lot. It certainly started the movements, move to amend free speech for people that exist to this day. But uh, we start our chapter in 1973, 74. We're looking at what Congress is passing in the 76 Buckley v. Vallejo, and there's a series of rulings. And I believe that what Citizens United has become in the mind of the average person, you know, the person who's engaged when you go to a room, it is a shorthand for a series of Supreme Court rulings over the last 40 years that have added up to a completely fluid zone where money can flood in from one way or another. And primarily it is still, you know, individual money. Uh, it, it may never be fully corporate, we don't know. Uh, some places corporations are giving and they have, but not a lot. Uh, and so. I think it's best understood as that shorthand, rather than as you know the whole that the Citizens United itself. I actually think if I if I had to choose between Citizens United and Buckley v. Vallejo, I'd probably choose Buckley as the more serious issue. It's just that Citizens United is the one that's excited energy. Yeah. And, and just to follow up, and I'll give it to someone else. If if it turned out that it really were particularly public traded publicly traded companies that were doing all this, you'd have the avenue of of a shareholder action or something else mm -hmm. to. to Absolutely. Deal with it, which you don't have here. Yeah. Uh, over here, you've been, yeah, hi. Well, I don't know. Guy Dietrich, I'm a fellow at Harvard. Hey, Guy. Hi, how are you? Uh, 
Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts here. Um, maybe I'll expand on the, the whole uh, corporate America theme for a second. You, you know, you guys are, are missing the fact that U.S. corporations pay the highest taxes, the highest corporate taxes of any uh, country in the world. All our trading partners pay taxes typically uh, a third to 60 percent of our level. So the notion that somehow, you know, the big evil corporate America is, is the, the, the problem here, I think, is, is a little misguided. Um, you know, the Kochs and, and uh, Shelley Adelson create hundreds of thousands of jobs. And um, the big corporations are owned by U.S. pension funds and guys like you and me. Uh, so I, I guess I'm, I'm just feeling you guys are coming at this from the wrong perspective. Um, and um, I, I just wonder, I, I don't really hear a lot of solutions to this gap that appears to um, be apparent where, you know, you're trying to invigorate, you know, the average guy in the street to go out and vote. What, 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 what do you think the solutions really are? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start, and then okay. Bob's much better on the corporate issues. Uh, but it, I think there are a lot of solutions, and, and one of the things is uh, to end gerrymandering now, right? We had a 1964 Supreme Court ruling that basically said it was a bad idea, and then people got scared about implementing it. The number one barrier to democracy in, in America is gerrymandering. The reason our government's shut down today is gerrymandering. It's not, you know, all these other things are vital. They flow through that reality. So if you want to talk about a structural change that we all ought to be able to agree on, whether we believe corporate, I happen to think corporations are incredibly dominant. Uh, but whether we think that or not, whether you're liberal, conservative, Republican, or Democrat, I think you ought to agree that we should have competitive elections. That we ought to just, you know, we ought to draw our districts so they're competitive. And you want to know why this current shutdown is not going to end real quickly? Why it has potential to go on for quite a while? Because in 1995, the last time we did a shutdown, 79 Republican members of Congress represented districts that had voted for Bill Clinton. Today, as a result of hyper-gerrymandering, only 17 Republican districts voted for Barack Obama. And the Republican advantage in Republican districts today is, in 1995, it was a six-point advantage. Today, it is a 11.5 advantage. We've almost doubled it. So this is a fundamental reality. We have, create, we have systematized our corruption of politics to such an extent that the candidates, as is well said, the candidates now choose their voters. The voters don't choose their candidates. So that's a simple change, which you and I are going to disagree on corporations. But I bet you, if we're honest, we ought to both agree that I'd like to put you and Bob up on the podium running for Congress, and you can debate each other. I, I wouldn't have a chance. You'd have a good chance. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. But anyway, that's an answer. Will, that's one. I will say, if you look at uh, the number of people on food stamps when Obama got elected, mm -hmm. there were 20 million. Today, there are 47 million. Uh, and, um, you know, I would argue those 47 million people have an incentive to vote for uh, the status quo. Although, can I just tell you one thing? Number one, f number one government recipient aid county, it, counties in the country, when you look at them, they voted, you know, they're down in eastern Kentucky and Tennessee, some of them. They voted for, Ro for Romney. Graham Smith, I'm a fellow. Oh, sorry. Graham Smith, I'm a fellow at the Ash Centre here. Um, and as you can tell from the accent, I'm not that familiar with your polity. So, uh, <laughs> although I'm very much influenced by your polity, but not. Um, the, my question is about the amendment. This is intriguing for me. I'd not really, I don't really know much about it. But I wonder if some of the amendments you talked about before were quite simple amendments. It was, do you, inf do you enfranchise these people or don't you? Mm -mm. And I wonder with your amendment that you're suggesting whether or not the complexity of, yes, we need to do something, but what that something is, is much more complex than some of the other things that were done in the past. Now, I, I, I would, that's for, for you to enlighten me on, but at the moment it sounds, the, the examples you gave were, should we give the women the vote? Should we, that, those kind of things compared to get money out of politics, which is a very, very complicated issue. And lots of people want to see a change in that area, but do they want to see the same change? Let me, let me take a bit. And, um, you ever dated? Um, not for 22 years. Yeah, I know, it's tough. I know, it's hard for all of us, brother. But the fact of the matter is, there are, some, there are some folks who will suggest relations between men and women are complicated. 
And if you go back and you look at the debate about enfranchising women, oh my gosh, that was ugly. You had hunger strikes, force feeding of people, people chaining themselves to the White House, and people saying in the U.S. Senate that if you gave women the right to vote, you would literally have the collapse of the republic because they wouldn't have the guts to let us go into war. And the fact of the matter is that if you study the, the extension of the franchise to women, you understand why it took us the better part of 130 years after we were founded to do it. I, I the question of are you for or against the franchise? Are the, are the amendments worded? I mean, the question are, is it hard? Is it, yeah, to write an amendment that's clear and simple mm -hmm. and not. And, and, and is a clear, yeah. clear movement behind, sure. yeah. uh, behind that particular word? I, I think it can be done, but that's certainly one of the great the questions you have question. to resolve and solve. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and there's no guarantee you can do it. As a rule, and I'm speaking generally, I think uh, campaigns around amendments oftentimes. Uh, crystallize before they do the actual wording, sort of on the principle. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then once everyone's all in, you, it's much easier to negotiate. You try to negotiate before everyone's all in, then the thing breaks down. And I think that would probably be here. And once everyone's, you've got the momentum for, uh, for an amendment, then there's tremendous incentive to get it done, get it done simply and clearly, and, 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 and just don't fog it down with stuff that could bar its uh, success. My name is Arif, and I'm a public administration candidate at Kennedy School. And thanks for a very interesting talk in the book. And in the book, you talk about like the remedies in terms of like free air time, independent journalism, shorter, cheaper elections, and nonpartisan election commission. But these are things which are going to flow from above. And then we have the issue of full amendments, and that's going to go uh, go from below. But like. Uh, at Kennedy School, there are a lot of people who have aspirations of running for office, yes. like right from city council to senators to governors, and some even president. I don't know. <laughs> so Cops. I, I look at those people, and they're like in their uh, 20s and, and 30s, and they're going to probably run in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And some of these things might happen, some things might not happen. So what's, what's the message for you? Like there are people who really want to run fairly, don't want to use big money, don't want to do a, a, all, this, all this stuff. But what options do they have? Well, I'll start with that, because that's one of the reasons we wrote this book. Going back to our conversation in the late 1990s, John and I have a lot of friends who are in elected office. We work with a lot of members of Congress and friends who've run for office unsuccessfully. And one thing that was you striking a couple to, that won. And, a couple, so, and one of our friends who won, who's now in the U.S. Senate, um, you know, was, I remember we were talking to him once, and he's an ideal public servant. He's in there for the right reason. He's not going to become a lobbyist. But he was explaining how much time he had to spend raising money. And this was like eight or nine years ago. And it, it astounded us mm -hmm. how much time he spent, even when he wasn't in a campaign, on the phone dialing for dollars. And you know, we were thinking, God, why would someone want to be in American politics if you're spending two, three, four hours a day at times calling up rich people asking for money? which is a lot of what politicians do. And once the campaign starts, this friend was telling us his campaign, he'd be in the car going from event to event, and they'd be handing him phones ready to go to talk to rich people and just keep him going. He did not have a single moment when he was not raising money when he was off the podium during the last several months of the campaign. And this is standard. Uh, Bernie Sanders introduced us uh, two weeks ago, and he made a new speech. He said, people have to understand that when you're a member of Congress now, you are dialing for dollars constantly. It's what you do. And the re this gets to your point. It's hard to say to a young person who wants to get into public life desperately because they want to do the right thing. They want to be a public servant. And then they, and you know this is the future face of them. It's, it's distressing. It's one of the things that motivates us to understand it so we can take the money out of politics so we can have a generation of young people enter public life who want to do it for the right reason and stay in it. Because what we see oftentimes these young people get their foot in the water and go, we yikes, this isn't oh, yeah. what I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. This wasn't the world I wanted to enter. You know, I was reading Lincoln and I was reading the civics class about politics. I want to be a public servant. I want to you know, do the, the right thing. And I'm in an environment where basically I'm just simply doing nothing but raising money. Oftentimes, not even for their own campaign. Once you're in office, you have to raise it for your party's congressional campaign committee constantly. Let me just, just say one quick thing on it, that, that I cover politics for a living. And I love it. I love covering politics. I started when I was 11 years old. No, I'm not kidding. I rode my bike down the main street in Union Grove, Wisconsin, went to the paper. They let me, they, it was a one-man print shop. They let me cover politics. 
I started, I covered, I interviewed the Vice President of the United States when I was 12 because he came to our town for a Wisconsin primary and he said he, he, said he wanted to meet with the local media. And so there I was with <laughs> Hubert Humphrey and, and I had my list of questions and he politely sat through them. It was the high point of my life and the low point of his. And, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, and this is a really big deal, um, politics isn't fun anymore. It's not. I mean, young people can come in and have a joyous time in electing Barack Obama. You saw the incredible joy of people running in. And frankly, friends of mine who are involved with the Tea Party have had joyous moments where they're very excited about that. But, but those are triumphalist moments. The day-to-day the -day of politics in this country is a chore. It's a chore. It's not fun. It is a, it is a real ugly struggle to collect a lot of money and to do all sorts of structural stuff. And now that you have to figure out how to be a, do data mining so that you can communicate through smartphones. And, and it's like, oh, please. The, 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 time, the chance an idea gets into this conversation is zero, right? And if an idea does get in the conversation, they tell you don't talk about it because that might make it harder to raise money. So the fact of the matter is, I, I think I write books with Bob because um, I'm pretty sure that we're not going to get all the reforms I want in the short order. But I would like to finish my career as a po writer about politics writing about fun politics again. And so I want to make a whole bunch of changes so that at the end of the game, it's about young people with big ideas wanting to take hold of their destiny and, and change the country. I think we can do it. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think anybody who gets into politics now simply to be in politics, I mean, if that's all they want, that's fine. But, but uh, I think you have to be a reformer now as well. You can't just come into politics and think, I'm going to get office and do big things. You have to come into politics and say, I'm seeking office because I want to change this thing and make it better.